and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Some of you may know him from Boss Fight at the Movies, some of you may know him from the Boss Syndrome podcast, but he is the one and only full screen boss fight. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight? I'm doing fine. How are you doing? I'm doing good. My employers decided to panic over the whole winter storm thing and clo- and close the office, so I had so I'm on a I'm on a one day staycation. Even oh, though nice. even though it's not it's not even that cold. It's like it was like thirteen degrees this afternoon. Yeah, it was actually warm where I was too, but I had to do uh ice removal because we have uh, frozen mist and that's uh, always a fun time watching kids slide around the sidewalk mm-hmm. but but seriously it wasn't that it wasn't that um wasn't that cold 13 I know oh, some people might say 13 degrees is fr- is 13 degrees Fahrenheit is fr- is frigid what the hell are you talking about but by st- by the standards of where I come from that's tame. I was going to say, like, I've lived in the Midwest for now going on 15 years, and cold is kind of default, so it's, it didn't help that I, I worked in a, uh, when I did retail, I worked in a frozen section, so I am practically Victor Freeze at this point. Uh, <laughs> you and everybody else, and I think the last time, last time I worked retail was the time I got caned. Yikes. <laughs> um, I was working, I, I was working Black Friday. Oh, it was, there you go. <laughs> because 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 a friend because a friend of mine asked asked me to, and I said I said you're gonna owe me one for this, mm-hmm. which I did make sure to collect on that debt. Oh yeah, definitely. But a lot a lot of times I had to do I had to endeavor to break up fights. Yep. And My- midway through one of them, I fe- I feel this I feel like so- I feel this sharp pain on the back of my head, and it turn oh, no. and I turn around and I see I see this Karen looking bitch with a bent cane. Oh my god! Did she I'm- put the cane on you? Yeah, it was one of those collapsible canes, so it oh, okay. so it horse collared over my head. Oh, it must have been aluminum. Okay, mm-hmm. I- or so- you could be that strong. I don't know. <laughs> I, I I have no idea, and I didn't care to ask. Mm. And after that, I after that, I just I just walked back, collected myself for a bit because I was I was concerned that I was concussed. Somehow yeah. I wasn't. I picked up my stuff and I went home. And I went home. My boss I sees me le- sees me leaving. He says, "Where are you going?" He's like, "I'm going home." <laughs> If I were like in that situation, and I were like injured. Nah, I'm done. I'm done. I watched uh, my former co-host from uh, Boston Room Podcast. Uh, he was with me. We both worked at Walmart at the time. That's where we met to to and got the idea to do the, the show. Mm-hmm. And he got punched in the face over an Xbox 360, which figured that one out. I never got I never got punched, but I think I think it's because nobody wanted to try and get try and trade fist with the tall guy. Yeah, that's reasonable. So I always I always look I I know I'm very jovial and happy usually in my content when mm-hmm. it was still around, but like a, it, when I'm like at work, I probably have resting bitch face. <laughs> so a lot of people think that I'm either angry or whatever. I'm not. I'm just it's. Uh, it, it's just a, a demeanor thing, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. <clears throat> now, I usually whenever I do interviews, I usually ask about humble beginnings. Um, okay. But in this case, what I, I'd like to shift it a little bit. What would you 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 strike me as you strike me as more of someone who leans towards consoles than PC. So, what was your fir- what was your first console proper? Not one that Ooh. got bar- not one that got borrowed around. Your first one that was in the damn house. Well, I mean, it's it's funny you mention that because I am I kind of transitioned into a PC guy within the last like four years. But my very first console 
I was enamored with the Nintendo Entertainment System. I, now, my cousins had an Atari 7800. No, they had an Atari 2600. I got a 7. Nobody had a 7800. Those things sucked. Yeah, I got. I found one in a thrift store like uh, about five or six years ago, and it's just sitting underneath my television, collecting dust with the other consoles. <laughs> it was. It, I have it for historical purposes only. <laughs> As somebody who fancies himself a wannabe historian, I can understand that sentiment. Yeah, I mean, it still plays twenty six hundred games, so I guess there's some there's some good that comes out of that, but. Uh, yeah, I got a I got an NES. Uh, I want to say the year after they first released, so it would be in December of 1986, and uh, it was one of the dual. It was a the console deck system that had Duck Hunt and uh, Super Mario Brothers included. Mm-hmm. So you learn you learn to hate dogs as much as everybody else. Uh, I I've tried to shoot that dog so many times when I was a kid. Yeah. It's no surprise that there was a Flash game that was made that was all about shooting that damn dog. Here's the funny part, though. In the arcade, the uh, the uh, versus system version of Duck Hunt, you can actually shoot the dog. But they took it out probably for... The, well, you, you don't want kids like just randomly shooting dogs on whims or whatever. It kind of makes people think things. I'd imagine the I'd imagine the other reason is a lot of people were a lot of people were a bit cautious after the um, laser tag incident. Yeah, that was uh, very much not a good time. We also had the satanic panic thing, and everybody's mm-hmm. on on eggshells over that, which nothing different from the, today's nonsense. Same shit, different day is how I look at it. Exactly. That's probably why I've, I got so comfortable in doing content covering stuff or that's going on. Is like, well, I grew up in the '80s. I dealt with all that stuff. My parents were like religiously, not it's kind of borderline fanatical, but like they still had some common sense. Yeah, I um, I grew up in the I grew up in the '90s, so I had to deal with some with some of the af- with some of the after effects of it. But mm-hmm. there, but there were there were other non there were other controversies that I had to put, I had to put up with just as much as anybody else, which is why I say um, same shit, different day. Especially, yeah. and what really validated that mindset was, I was in I was in a library. I, th- I think I was I think this was when I was in middle school, and they had a bunch of old um, newspapers from like from like the Times, and in one of them was a remark about how it is imp- it is impossible to waltz without being improperly aroused. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. And I found this out right around the right around the time that there was a controversy about about dances at school dances being too provocative. Oh, uh, why does that remind me of? Uh, have you ever seen "Can't Buy Me Love"? I think so, but that was quite a while ago. It, there was a scene where th- this guy he gets invited to the dance, so he watches like a uh, nat a Nat Geo thing of like African tribal dances. And he <laughs> decides to do the African tribal dance at the thing. And it, it caught on and everybody in the dance was doing it. It was just so absurd that it was just hilarious. Yeah, I can, I can certainly see how that could, be, how that could be a thing. But what it highlighted for me is, is the whole, is the fainting couch issue is not new. No. No, certainly not. And I was in I was in a what for me personally I was in a weird position because I got started with a NES that was lent that was lent to us by a family friend that had a bunch of different um, games. One of them was Mar- Mario Mario slash Duck Hunt. Um, it also had it also, also the first. A lot of a lot of what's considered classic. So the original mm-hmm. Castlevania, the first two Zelda games. Um, I think, I think, I think, I think Donkey Kong. Um, just a just a bunch of just a bunch of different stuff, along with a handful of others that I can't I can't remember at this time. Sounds um, like a good Saturday afternoon. Yeah, the. So I ended up getting I ended up getting my pathological hatred of Medusa heads very early in life. 
<laughs> As you should. <laughs> also, I don't hate Zelda Two, but it does do some it does do some things that annoy me and has some hand breaking moments. Yeah. One of the bi the big example for me is Death Mountain. I loved that game until like uh, I actually got far enough in to know that it's a, some of that stuff can be a very frustrating experience. I remember when I actually I think it was right towards the end of the NES's lifespan. I want to say probably by 92, 93. I had wound up going to Toys R Us and uh, they had Mega Man 6 and Zelda 2 and I want to say Star Tropics 2 uh, on clearance. So you, you were talking like about $4 a piece. So I snagged all of those up. I think I grabbed Mega Man 6. I grabbed uh, and those uh, Zelda 2 and Star Tropics 2. Mm -hmm. And I wound up playing through Zelda 2 just for the rest of the summer because I was kind of... I It was summertime. Couldn't necessarily get a uh, like summer job just yet because I wasn't old enough and I was just looking for things to do. And uh, that was... Zelda 2 is very frustrating. <laughs> I know some people will say that if that there's a that there's a guide to Death Mountain in Nintendo Power. I didn't have that at that time. No, I yeah, I, a lot of that is I just kind of felt my way through it. But on the other side of the coin, um we had we had a Apple II. Okay. So I was able I was able to experience the glory days of um MECC. Okay. Who um were who at who um have can trace their origins back to the U, back to the U of M, um, University of Minnesota, I should say, not University of Mich of Michigan or Missouri or so, or something like that. Um, but I also but those games I end up using as a counter argument whenever somebody says that educational games suck. Yeah, or I was rather, gonna say, I, I like educational games to an extent. It depends on the game. Um, it has to actually be a game. Yes, the reason a lot agreed. of them suck is because they're not games; they're glorified flashcards. Yeah, like, like the, uh, a lot of the math games that <laughs> existed back back then. Math Blaster was my punching bag for this exact reason. Yes, exactly. That was my first uh, foray into "quote unquote" computer gaming at the time, because like we, our classrooms had Math Blaster and the the one Apple sitting in there. Mm -hmm. I know in. Uh, I want to say it's shop class or technology as they called it back in the nineties. Uh, there was a crap ton of uh, Apple twos in in there. And I played a lot of star Trek, yeah. uh, which I don't know how I got into playing that game, but I like the series, but it, like the game just, I guess see playing all the different ships, whatever it was, was the, uh, the draw. Well, that seems that seems to be the reason why why STO still exists is be is people wanting all those different ships. Yeah, I could see that. Although, and same same thing applies with Eve, but that's a whole different can of worms. I'm not drunk enough to get into. I was gonna say <laughs> Eve. Eve looks like something I would be interested in if I was willing to dump large amounts of my free time into something. And probably large amounts of money, depending. But I, I, I have I have a complicated relationship with with Eve. I'll put I'll put it that way. That's fine. But yeah, um, the bigger the bigger one for me was um was Number Munchers and all of its variants, because stuff like that is gonna is gonna feel like a game. That's that's really the key thing. You can do you can do you can ed you can educate all you like but if it doesn't feel like a game then it's get, then you're going to be undermining it. Yeah. So I'm surprised they actually let us play uh we had a computer class too when I was in middle school and they actually let us play SimCity. Mm -hmm. Like we had to do a 50 year run and uh once you have 50 years of uh like just play play time or in game play time we would why or we give the teacher our data, and pretty much we could play whatever we want after that. Mm -hmm. And 
And I do I do apologize if you hear that vacuum cleaner in the background. Oh, that's fine. I I'm sure you probably hear my dog barking <laughs> at the out the window behind me or somewhere. But I will I will free I will freely admit that a lot the big the big punching bag that I always had when it came to, when it came to what not when it came to what not to do was Mario teaches typing. Oh, I've heard of that, but I never never took the opportunity to play it. I I avoided those games like the plague. Like Mario is missing. And it's like, oh, that's a history game. Yeah, I pass. <laughs> I never I never played Mar. I would always hear about Mario is missing, but I never played it until I started getting online. Mm-hmm. And then, I, then I was like, "Yeah, now I now I understand why." But um, <laughs> I always saw those in Blockbuster, and I was like, "Nah." <laughs> but it it is, it is kind it is kind of funny that back that back then and even now there's that attitude of of ga- of gaming being this ki- being th- this childish affair, um, because well, Nintendo hard is a, is a thing for a reason and. Truth be told, the reason what the reason why it exists is because is because of the um is because of the video game crash. Yes, it is a, a large portion of that. Like as somebody who is a uh, Battletoads uh, alumnus, <laughs> alumni. You're not an alumni. I... You're a survivor. Get it right. <laughs> uh, I do have PTSD from that game. Uh... <laughs> I've spent the entirety of my seventh grade, like just uh, th- again when we talked about hyper focusing uh, before the show started. Mm. That's one of the things that that's kind of I hyper focused on that game for an entire year, memorized all the patterns and everything just to beat that game. But yeah, I going back to this uh, the what you were saying about the the crash, definitely. Like, uh, one of the big contributors to the crash was too much shit. Oversaturation of poor quality content. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yes. Of course. the The other thing, what there there were three pillars. That was one of them. The other one was the e, was the ET game. Mm-hmm. Um. Everybody knows about this. Everybody knows about the story and how that thing got made and the whole thing with the with the landfill that up until a few years ago was an urban rumor. Mm-hmm. Um. And PC. Those were the three. Th- those were the three things that contributed. Yeah. That. That's what. That was the funny thing. Is like. Even when the crash happened, PC gaming still existed, and uh, I know there's a kind of a push for people to leave consoles and go directly into that PC market. Well, PC and PC Engine had already had had already established a foothold in in Europe and in Japan. Mm-hmm. That foothold wasn't qu- wasn't quite as much there in the states. Yeah. I mean, I guess to, to be fair, like when we were hardcore into the NES and stuff like that, the Mega Drive pretty much reigned supreme in Europe. There is, there is certainly that, but there's also, I think the other, I think the other reason was ju- was just a lot of a lot of the a lot of the PC Engine um, stuff was more was more local to that region. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the UK guess- especially. You also had like the the ZX Spectrum and all a lot of other like things too. I mean, it, I get it. I I don't know how. I, I've actually when I went back and read a lot of things concerning like just the the post crash days and just the, the things that led up to the NES. I always thought it was interesting that we act that gaming kind of survived in that way. It's just. It, a lot of things shouldn't have happened, and they wound up happening, then creating the perfect storm. Mm-hmm. But after that, Nintendo had put in a rule that you could only you could only um you a, a third party company could only make a certain number of games for per year for and get the. I want to say it was five. I I'm not sure. I have I have, I have heard everywhere from five to nine. Yeah, because. That was the whole reasoning for Konami, basically, to circumvent that by creating Ultra Games and uh, the whole Tengen thing, which is an entirely huge shit show in itself. Uh, there was also the fact that Atari tried to tried to um, 
try to cheat their way around the lockout chip. Yeah, which that, that was Tingen. Yeah. <laughs> which ended up ended up biting them in the ass because years later they tried to do a class action lawsuit against Nintendo's monopoly, in their words. And Nintendo was able to use the fact that they pulled some stunts to try and get the schematic for the NES so they could bypass the lockout chip. Yep. Which pretty much killed their court case then and there. Like between that and the uh, the Universal lawsuit with uh, over uh, Donkey Kong, I, I've never seen so many like massive L's in one time period. And that, then I'd like to say I've never seen that many massive L's, but um, let's not forget that in my ne- in my neck of the woods in tabletop gaming, I saw the biggest L I'll ever I'll ever see with an entire industry rejecting one company's fuck ups. That's pretty big now i will say that's that's been entertaining like in the the time period where i was basically uh i want to say in the last couple of months or whatever because i've been having the issues with the uh my my drama with youtube uh i've kind of taken a back seat and just kind of l- surveyed the land to see what was going on and just watching that play out is fascinating i've been at ground zero since the whole thing went down so, to to give my perspective, since about 2000, there's been a thing called the Open Gaming License that allowed mm-hmm. people to make um, D and D content third party. Okay. You you've got you have there's a few rules you have to follow, and you have to put the agreement in the back of your book and make note that it requires it requires the D and D player's handbook, as well as okay. the, as well as the D20 system logo on the on the back of said book. Okay. But no, but that's a, that's as far as it goes. Everything after that is hands off. Even when it comes to, say, dem- demands for royalties, isn't re- isn't really a factor. Now this did result in a bit of a market flood, but that but nobody could but nobody could have predicted that. Yeah. And this has been this has been this this was a fairly under a fairly understood thing since two thousand. Then. Wizards of the Coast, I guess because they wanted to monetize their players more, decided that they're going to do a whole new one that requires you to rep- report your report your earnings, which is really skirting the law, especially when you're dealing with international developers. Yes. And you owe royalties if you have three quarters of a million in uh, in um revenue, not profit, just revenue. Now the amount of royalties that was owed was never was never stated, but the fact that you were expected to pay up if you were making that that amount of that amount if that amount of money was showing up, which which um these kind of things ended up pissing off pretty much everybody in the industry, and a lot of people were concerned that they were that they were going to be run out of business because of this. Yeah, like there there was that there was that legitimate concern, which is how you got the open D and D um hashtag getting started. Because content creators, um, players, and de- and developers alike were giving the middle finger, um, they ended up losing about forty thousand subs- about forty thousand subscribers to the D and D Beyond service. That's crazy. There was that rumor that th- that um, they were planning on doing a D and D Beyond Plus. And for the record, D and D Beyond is basically a char- a character manager with some house ruling ability, but it's very, but it's still very limited. Mm-hmm. And I and when I had looked at it, it was a no go because you couldn't make custom classes. You can make custom subclasses, items, spells, feats, but not classes. And the, and I like making full on classes instead instead of just trying to tape on a subclass to something that are to a class that already exists and I may or may not have issues with. Understandable. So. so Plus, plus, I'd been using Hero Lab for years by that po- by that point. So I'm like, you got to. This is what you're competing with. So you got to give me something that's better than that, than just the brand name, the brand name, in order to make this work. So and, I was hearing. Uh, mm-hmm. oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, is were they trying to kind of push the well the company? Were they trying to push the game into more of a MMO kind of format, or am I? Am I hearing that wrong? Or they were tr- they were trying to push far more into a digital format, and one of the 
Some people have made the MMO comparison, but I've been hearing that particular thing since 2008 with the controversial 4th edition, so I don't pay that any mind. Okay. I I wanted to clarify that, because I've heard different things from different people, and I just kind of... I try to... Whenever I hear something, I usually just kind of keep it in the back of my head, but I don't necessarily like uh, take it as gospel until I, I've like at least heard multiple perspectives on it. Mm-hmm. And bes- besides, they had ar- they had already tried the whole go full MMO thing tw- um, three times by this point. D and D online, which is oh, which is which was pretty which was pretty all right. Mm-hmm. It just it just aged itself out. Oh. Neverwinter, which was not good. And Storm Coast, which didn't which didn't even fu- which didn't even fully release. Just problem that, problem a big problem is that is unless you have people who absolutely know what they're doing, um when you're trying to do D&D into a into a form into another format, it's mm-hmm. just gonna feel like a poor man's fantasy pastiche. Yeah, I can see that. You know, kind of like how a a de- a dead space. If someone were to try and do a movie version of Dead Space, it would just be a poor man's Alien. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see that. I, or uh, or event or event horizon, depending on which you prefer. But saying this, really, saying this, something's a poor man's Alien is a, is a wide net, anyways. There's a lot of a uh, uh, lot of B movies from the '80s that were like bad alien clones. What was it? Uh, I want to say Galaxy of Terror, mm-hmm. being one of those. I'm a I'm a huge '80s movie guy, and I'm a huge horror guy. So uh, a lot of those things will probably come up in this discussion. Yeah, <laughs> but the point the point is 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 um. When you're trying to when you're trying to take away the interactive for something that is an interactive knockoff of other media, mm-hmm. you just you just get a poor man's res- result out of that. Oh well, yeah, it's usually like uh, when I I see these modern interpretations of things that came out uh, a long time ago, I always feel like it's the the uh, direct to video version of uh, uh, designer knockoff. Like when it what was it? Uh, when Frozen came out, you had Ice Queen and and like Walmart. And oh, the 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 Asylum movies. Yes, which Asylum has its own Pluto channel, which is ridiculous. <laughs> I have not. I have not. I've only seen. The sad thing is, Asylum managed to do a better John Carter than the than the official one. But Oof, that's <laughs> good on them. <laughs> Which is which is baffling because John Car because um well actually actually no with the problem with the problem with John Carter is everybody's is it's been around for over a hundred years and everybody's taken notes from it yeah but when it come but when it comes to when it come when it came to the when it came to the whole th- getting back to the OGL thing um mm-hmm. wizards tried to tried to p- has um has also tried to pivot into um into go- going more going more with digital which they're about they're about 20 years late on yeah. as well as, as well as trying to put in as well as they're trying to put forward their own virtual tabletop which isn't out yet but they've already screwed themselves over because of one specific thing that they wanted to do which was very tone deaf and that was have um have have console style gra- have console style graphics using the Unreal Engine. Oh no! The reason why this is a problem is part of the appeal with virtual tabletops is that you can run them on just about anything because they're not resource or graphically graphically intense, and people prefer. And because of that, you can put in your own gra- your own um gra- your own graphics or graphics that you grab from somewhere else to use as representatives for miniatures and the like. Yeah. By ha- by having it be un- by having it be on un- using using the Unreal Engine and using pre- using preset um, um, polygonal graphics, you're bottlenecking the kind of you're bottlenecking the kind of things you can do with it and the kind of audience it's going to have. 
which is why which is why I say they screwed themselves over before it even started. Yeah, obviously not everybody can have the the best computer to run everything. Oh, it's- that that end. You're not exactly hurting for choice when it comes to virtual tabletop these days. Roll you have you have Roll Twenty, you have Shard, mm-hmm. you have Foundry, you have Fantasy Grounds, you have you have you have Astral, you have D you have D twenty you have D twenty Pro, and you have an incountable amount of Discord bo- Discord bots to to mm-hmm. use that method if you if you so choose. And there's stuff like Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator can be used for this kind of thing. I think I've seen a couple of streams where people are using tabletop sim- simulator. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty robust system, but the point is is that that's what that's what you have to compete against. You have to have that level of features minimum. So basically there's a a, a bevy of different things or whatever that are competing with this ancient technology that they're trying to roll out. <laughs> uh so that's so like uh that sounds like to me whoever's in charge over there just kind of doesn't necessarily have the business savvy to uh, I liken it to to the original incarnation of the XFL. Oh my god. <laughs> That's taking me back. No, the reason why the reason why I say that is it was very clear that Vi- that Vince did not understand football culture. Yeah. Uh, that's that's an understatement. <laughs> you've you've probably seen that interview where he got eaten alive by Bob Costas. I haven't seen the interview, but like I, I, I that doesn't surprise me in the least. I, I know I understand Vince has a great understanding of business, and as as far as showmanship goes, pretty pretty solid. But there's you could tell he was out of his depth on that one. Hmm. And the thing, and that the, the um the cur- the the current head of Wizards of the Coast, their background is in the games division of Microsoft, oh, and okay. they were trying to they were trying to use that same that those same monetization tricks that we see in the in the AAA end of um, video games in the tabletop landscape. The yeah. problem that the problem is it's a different culture, it's a different mindset. And you can't take that same approach. It's like trying to put lungs in a fish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like it's not it's not compatible. You have to consider the uh, the the well the lay of the land, the environment, and everything like that. And oh boy, these current uh, CEOs and people they really just they walk into these companies thinking that they have a one size fits all approach to everything. And it just doesn't work. No. And my, my particular theory is that the reason why they did this little stunt was to show Daddy Hasbro that they can be profitable. Because yeah. they got hounded in... They got, when they did that ridiculously expensive booster, pa- booster pack for the 30th anniversary, mm-hmm. they got hounded hard in the media to the point that even Bloomberg was roasting them. Oof. And... I think I think this was their, this was them trying to show that they can that they can be, that they can be profitable. Yeah. Oh. Um, but uh, too bad it kind of backfired in the face. Yeah. And of course a lot a lot of lawyers had posited whether or not this could even be done and even the possibility of whether or not um tech of tech firms would would be not would be not happy about the precedent that this could potentially set when it comes to open licenses. Because what they were basically doing is trying to retroactively change an o- a open license that had been around for the longest time. <clears throat> so many people just kind of like just they looked at that situation and it, it was so weird because the just the split. Because uh, I, I noticed the one of the things I do notice about uh, just that type of environment is you have. It's all split between the two kind of mindsets of, of modern day. And uh, both sides of the aisle, like the people that kind of lean more into the uh, SJW mindset and the people that just kind of, they want to be left alone to enjoy their stuff. They're all sided together and just to voice their displeasure with this whole scenario. And it was, it's just, 
interesting. And they tr- they tried to they tried to walk it back and claim that and claim that the the um the dr- the the so, the quote unquote o, the OGL contract that was that was put out was just a draft. Tried to put mm-hmm. out a new one, which also got rejected, especially especially when there was a dubiously named morality clause, where if yeah. they fu- if they happen to find your work objectionable, they can take it off they can take it off and you can't do anything about it, yeah, claiming that you that, uh... claiming that you oh, that while you own your work, you're giving them a per- a perpetual royalty free license to do with it as they wish. That's the one that had a lot of YouTubers up in arms, and I I kind of agree with them on that. It's like, well, I mean, uh, YouTube is going through its morality clause thing too because a lot of the stuff that that uh, they found issue with with my my channel was uh, mainly uh, it was morally objectionable and uh, boss fight at the movies, which is uh, well. well MST 3K M- with a little bit more spice. Uh, that was getting a lot of problems because uh, uh, they didn't like uh, some of the jokes that we made. And so that was one of the issues. And there was, uh, I'm sure, a lot of the content that I made that kind of criticized a certain side of the aisle uh, probably wasn't winning any favors with them either. So. Mm-hmm. And for me, the, for me, the one of the, one of the big one of the bigger things that I that I was concerned with was that it was that they were going to use the morality clause as a trap. Yeah, I.e., pe- people were people would object to it, and then they'd say, "Ha! Look, the only reason you're objecting is because you're is because you're secretly a ra- a racist or an istophobe or yeah. what have you." You must have um, something to hide. Therefore, you're objecting to this. Yeah, thing. the 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 age old Kafka trap. <laughs> exactly. And then the, then the surprise happened, where they decided that they were going to put the whole th- the whole of the d- of the fifth the core fifth edition rule set, basically the stuff that was in the OGL, into a Creative Commons license. And because it was put in a Creative Commons license, there's no take backs. Oh no! And oh, this, this gets interesting, or just even more interesting with every little morsel. I can't help but sus. I do not believe in coincidences, and I can't help but suspect that part of the reason they did this was they had was um one of their investors was publicly thrashing with Wiz- Wizards of the Coast and calling them leaderless. I could see it. Uh, I I do find it interesting that a lot of and you see this in a lot of things that it's going on right now as well. People on the inside, if they really object to something and they know that it's going to have a negative connotation, they will leak things out to certain members of the media or certain YouTubers or whatever, just because they know that this isn't going to work out very well, and but they can't really do anything about it because the people up top are dead set on trying to push that thing. Yeah, and there w- there there were there were some on the ground people at Wizards who were who were leaking stuff to YouTubers and the like. Mm-hmm. Kind of kind of showing that the ma- that a lot that the management was out of touch. There was even one. Whether or not some people were saying this was fake, but there seemed to be the idea of doing a um, D and D Beyond Plus and locking homebrewing there at a cost of thirty dollars a month, which is more than people pay for fucking Netflix. Yeah, I was going. Well, speaking of Netflix, they had a similar issue too. <laughs> yeah, the whole the whole we're gonna ca- we're gonna cut off account sharing is re- is was really backfiring, especially since if the. If Netflix wants to bring people wants to bring people back onto the service, the answer is easy: just make good content. But yeah, it always comes down to content. Well, see, I, I, uh, I guess a little secret about me: I, before I got really into uh, our for full screen boss, I kind of took off as a thing. I hung out on a lot of forums, and one of those was uh, for there's this guy named Sean Malstrom who he was very into very much in the business 
and he talked about like blue ocean strategy which is the the kind of the basis for what uh iwata and uh reggie fils used for getting the wii where it was whatever so uh and one of the things that sean maelstrom usually talked about was how content is always king and i think a lot of current businesses they ignore the aspect of content and they just focus on profits for me for me it's all for me the thing that i ke- i keep noticing with a lot of bad business decisions is um looking having tunnel vision for short for um short term yeah it's always the quick dollar it's like what what can i do to get my mess as much money as possible in a short period of time except the problem the problem is when you do that your base it's like um oh it's like over harvesting in a on a farm mm-hmm. yeah you've you've Good. made you've been able to get a bunch of yield out of that but you also you've also screwed over your harvest for the next few years yeah yeah that's a good analogy and I, I I've seen that so much. You can see it in like how Marvel's being handled. You can see it in how a lot of companies are just dealing with certain things. And they tend to forget that the reason why they the product is doing so well is because you had a very dedicated following or audience that was cultivated over a number of years. So how do we how do we make as much money as we can? We completely screw over that dedicated fan base for a phantom fan base that may or may not exist. Have I ever told you about the greener grass fallacy? No, but I'm interested. Let's go. (laughs) You've probably heard the analogy that grass is always greener on the other side. Yes. Which certainly which certainly has its um it certainly has its perks. Mm-hmm. I choose to add to add one to add one particular um, avenue to that. The grass is always greener because of the radiation. Or yeah, uh, it kind of is reminiscent of uh, what was it Soundgarden's song uh, uh, "Outshined," where mm-hmm. he's like he says the grass is always greener where the dogs are shitting. Mm-hmm. And the thing. Because in, I've seen I've seen this plenty of times where somebody th- somebody thinks that if the, if they if they throw if they um, get rid of their current audience of undesirables, then this mm-hmm. brand new audience of des- of people of people that they approve of will magically show up. Which is funny because we've seen this play out. The first time I saw it play out was uh, I think it was like right in the middle of the just to tie back to what I was talking about before the Wii. Mm-hmm. Where the hardcore audience was being pushed away for the kind of uh, the ca- the, the, ca- the a casual people. yeah yeah the yeah and something that I had said at the time and I was called a hater for this was that audience isn't going to stick around they are going to pl- they're going to play but they're going to play um we sports we sports and nothing else. Yep, and you're did. not. <laughs> and it was then... it was a novelty to them. You go on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then, then t- then time passes. Um, a lot of a lot of the a lot of a lot of game. Now, granted, there was a lot of shovelware on the on the Wii, but a lot of ge- oh, a lot yeah. of good games barely were able to sell because because of this. Yeah. And then and then of course the stigma of um of my of motion controls happened which i will i will treat motion controls as my whipping boy until someone ties me down and forces me to stop i to be honest i i see why people don't like motion controls because they really they really kind of forced it now nintendo actually gave people other options for controllers but once motion controls became big, or once people saw like how much the Wii was selling and how the the concept of motion controls was like the flavor of the uh, the year, you saw a lot of companies just kind of diving headfirst into that. Especially with like say the Connect yeah. and the uh, the PlayStation Move, which I always laughed when I saw those. Well, especially with the Connect when they said the you are the controller angle. And I was like, the Sega Activator did exist, my dude. Calm down. <laughs> yeah, and the Activator sucked too. Yes, 
I did buy a Kinect just out of, again, a historical relevance. But <laughs> I barely use the damn thing. It's just sitting there collecting dust with everything else. Mm-hmm. But then, but then, the, then, um, obviously, the Wii U came around, and a lot of the, a lot of those casual, a lot of that casual audience they had cultivated didn't come with. Yeah, and they, they tried to, they tried to romance the hardcore fan base to their own peril. And the problem, the problem was, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Yeah, but. That's a, that's an example of what of what happens when you try and chase away your audience, thinking you're going to get this magical brand new one. Mm -hmm. And instead, instead, instead of gr instead of growing your growing your core audience by bringing pe bringing people into to have them go from casual to hardcores. Yeah, you can you can cater to both sides of that market, but you it has to be. Basically, you can put out your core games, and this is something Nintendo figured out like later on. Uh, you you have to appease that core fan base. You can mm -hmm. put out certain games that appeal to, like, say, casuals or just uh, a a further out uh, demographic that might be interested in it. But you should always focus on what you have. It's the same thing as a, in a relationship. It's like I'm I'm not going to go seeking other partners when I know my wife is dedicated and like she has everything that I that I I felt like I needed in a partner. That's just crazy talk, but people are weird and they they they're very impulsive. So yeah. now because in and I'm guess I'm guessing that the, I'm guess You'll notice that a lot, a lot of times, in addition to that whole bre that whole brand new audience thing, you'll have people who, th who um, who think that people will come will come into something anyways just because of the name. Yeah, and that was a mindset that I that I was seeing qu I was seeing quite a bit during the whole OGL debacle, where a lot of people had thought, yeah, this yeah this is it, as shit as it is. People aren't people aren't going to leave because because of the strength of the strength of the D and D brand. Hmm. Except um, they did, and in, fi in fact, um, Paizo ended up ended up selling ended up selling through their entire their entire print stock of the path of the Pathfinder core book in two weeks. That's awesome. Actually. That <laughs> the the print stock that they had was supposed to last them for a year, so they had they had to scramble in order to get a brand new print run going. Yeah, that's what happens when when companies think that they can just get away with murder just because people are uh, brand loyal. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't treat people any old way just from a business standpoint. You, I, It kind of goes back to the customer is always right, even though I have issues with that particular statement. The phrase... The phrase "the customer is always is always right" has take has taken a turn that I don't think was ever intended, because yeah. a lot of people seem a lot of people um have taken it to mean the customer is beyond reproach. When in reality it was in reality I think I think the I think the phrase was was meant to go with the idea that you ha that when you're doing that kind of business you have to cater to the customer the audience what have you. First, yeah. And yeah, I think that's uh, just maybe it's it probably most likely is the last. Well, my ten year, ten plus years in retail has soured me on that. Even though I'd still, as a business, a person that like just dabbles in business, or whatever, I would still adhere to it. Mm -hmm. It's just there's certain circumstances when you deal with people that you really just want to get them the hell out of you, out of the door. <laughs> There's a lot of Karens in, in retail, and you know oh, that. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I've I've seen I've seen more than I've seen more than my fair share of them, and more than my f and, um, I've even had to do, I've even had to deal with Karen employees. Oh my goodness. Oh um, yeah, there's quite a few of those I had to deal with too. Uh, oh, I can tell you stories. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure both of, I'm pretty sure both of us could, and maybe one one of these days I will do a, um. I will do a retailer horror stories um, stream 
That'd probably be that'd probably be good for Halloween because what's more horrifying than Black Friday? Oh yeah, you should bring JT Vega into that too because he I'm sure he's got some good Walmart stories. Mm-hmm. But in the what I do find what I do but um when I when I mentioned earlier about the about one of the um investors for Hasbro lambasting them they had spe- they had also specifically mentioned that it was a quote unforced error to pull, to pull this OGL shit when the, when um they when they've got a movie com- when they've got a D&D movie coming in a few months oh, a movie yeah. which if I'm being honest doesn't look all that great and is probably no. gonna, is probably going to die a death because for one they made they made they they made the same mistake that happened the last time somebody tried to do a D&D movie. Oh my god, and I I remember rushing to the theater and roping my friends in uh to go with me when cuz I that was that was right when I started getting into D&D. So like I I've said previously my parents were uh religious and uh, they were definitely in the uh idea that that anything that <laughs> fantasy related was ungodly so i with my own money i had a subscription to i want to say dragon magazine and that's like the start of me getting into uh just the whole idea of DD. because I, I i was thinking about possibly uh just creating my own game back then just based off of just uh, some ideas whatever because i wanted to do kind of something star jammer related hmm. but um spell jammer or spell jammer sorry i'm Two different ideas in my head, uh, Spelljammer related. So it was, I was reading a lot of those, and I heard the D and D movie was coming out, and I was like, "Oh, that sounds like it would be fun to watch." So I roped my friends in, and we went to the movie theater and watched it. And everybody walked out of there feeling a particular type of way. Um, I think I can, I think I can raise you one. I t- I talked my old man into into seeing Battlefield Earth with me. Oh my god. <laughs> And Did he I forgive you. <laughs> I've never, I've never asked. <laughs> oh, uh, I've never forgiven myself. I can say that. I can say that much. That thing's been on. Uh, it's been on various things, and I can never bring myself to sit down and watch it. I, ha- I have. I wish I didn't. But hey, we all have regrets, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But I do. I can. I can say for certain that I. <laughs> I had. T- I had. God, just re- just remembering that movie is fucking with me. Oh, uh, your PTSD. <laughs> I don't get. I don't get PTSD from Twitter. I get. P- I get PTSD from ha- from having to, from having to c- having to consume the worst of the worst of the worst. I've had to read through Fatal. I was gonna say, my dude, I've I've uh, I have a bunch of really bad B movies that I I have as guilty pleasures. So I, I know exactly how you feel. <laughs> I've sat through some real stinkers. Mm-hmm. Oh, although and some that and some that were just weird, like say Moon Trap. Oh yeah, or Ninja Terminator. If you've ever seen that one, I think I did. Um, it's it's it. I still I still don't know if that movie was real. <laughs> part of me want. Part of me wants to assume it was it was some AI art project. It's a fever dream. Mm-hmm. Oh. Then then again, I've then again, I'm go I'm going through a bunch of anime that Masaki Yuasa made, and hit and his style can be described as drugs. I can see that. I can see that. But it's like a like like watching anything that Koiki made. Mm-hmm. Uh. It's like there's so much fisheye lens that I don't know if I'm sober or not. <laughs> You're probably not. <laughs> I, I don't do drugs. I drink. I'm an alcoholic by trade, but uh, yes. <laughs> and well, I I don't do I don't do drugs because face because face with a frog exists. Oh. <laughs> I, I I I usually the way I explain it is that I have enough crazy going on as it is i don't need any like uh enhancements plus um i made the, i made the unfortunate mistake of 
of um seeing Return to Oz and think and thinking that it was gonna be like Wizard of Oz when I was a little kid. Part of me wants to like expose my daughter to that, but I don't know if I want to deal with the repercussions. Um, I used to I used to work at a at a uh, video rental store. Um, it wasn't Blockbuster. Blockbuster didn't have as much of a foothold in my area at the time. And what I mean, one day this ha this hockey mom comes in because okay I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna beat around the bush. I'm from Min I'm from Minnesota. You do, we don't have soccer moms. We have hockey moms. Oh, I can get I can get it. I dig it. And she puts a copy of Watership Down in front of me and asks if this <laughs> is appropriate for children. And um. <laughs> You know that you know that sh you know the whole shoulder angel and shoulder devil thing. <laughs> I don't ha I don't have that. I just have two shoulder devils. Fuck it, let it ride. Let's go. <laughs> and my shoulder devil said two words: "Say nothing." If you've seen Watership Down, you know exactly what they were getting themselves into. <laughs> oh my god, it's it's okay. I was uh, what was it? I was in a animation phase, like a hardcore animation phase before I got full on into anime. I think it was probably right at the beginning of the when you when OVAs were big back in the nineties. Mm -hmm. And I was just grabbing anything on it animated from Suncoast. And I was like, okay, I I got paid. It's Friday. I'm gonna grab one movie and I'm gonna i I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna have a pizza. And I'm gonna watch it. So I grabbed Ralph Bakshi's uh coonskin. <laughs> <laughs> I went into that thing unprepared. <laughs> I was like, "What the hell did I just get myself into?" But it was so awesome afterwards. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. It's just. It's just. Some sometimes you. Sometimes you really don't know what you're getting. What kind of rabbit hole you're getting yourself into. Fortunately, when that when that when that woman had come back and was and was ranting about about what was what the subject matter actually was, um, nobody ratted me out because I, I was out of town. I was at the top. I was out of town by the time she came back. Um, which some people have assumed have assumed that I had planned the whole thing like that. Oh, I will neither confirm nor deny, but. But um, because of my reputation as the as the best worst practical practical joker to the point that I've gotten the nickname the prankster prince, <laughs> nice. so, um, nobody's gonna believe me if I say that I ha say that I didn't plan on that. Well, that is a super villain tier move. No, a, su a super villain tier move was was me, was me messing with the coffee at my work so bad that that all my that all my coworkers are par are paranoid. <laughs> oh, that's like uh. So when I uh, worked at Walmart, uh, the daytime people would always mess with our our stuff. So we would buy individual like just coffee. Mm -hmm. So we would buy the things and we put it up in the in the cupboards basically for us at night. Daytime people would come in and they just ravage through our stuff and do whatever. So my friend, my best friend at the time, he was the best man at my wedding. Uh, he. <laughs> He took a bunch of chocolate brownie or chocolate muffins and put laxatives in them and just left them out. Uh, I I made a remote controlled air horn. And oh I, no! And i i hid the I hid the speaker for that remote control air horn in the worst place you could possibly hide it. Nice behind the toilet. Uh, talk about scared shitless. <laughs> yeah, everybody's made that joke. <laughs> there's there's been that there's there was the time that somebody asked me to make them a louder alarm clock and they learned very very quickly um be careful, be careful what you wish for because <laughs> i did make him a lot because he, he he was like is do you have any requests for what the sound should be he's like i don't care just make it loud okay in the business we call this foreshadowing Yes. <laughs> Do you remember the song that would play when you spend too much time underwater in the old Sonic games on the Genesis? Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so imagine that being played at six in the morning, full blast. Uh, that would that probably fuck me up pretty bad. <laughs> that probably I'm... that probably kill somebody from a heart attack. Going going from somebody who's like drowned. <laughs> 
<laughs> before as a kid. <laughs> that would probably mess me up really bad. <laughs> Um, he he got mad at me afterwards, and I and all I said was, "You asked for me. You asked for a louder alarm clock. Don't get mad at me because you because you gave me free reign on how on how I do it. Because that's technically what what happened. He he was like, I, I don't care how I don't care how you do it. Just to um, just just make it loud. You I, you sound like you have a bunch of friends that don't understand the concept of fuck around and find out." Well, sometimes, sometimes they do. I think they. I think what they underestimated was how was how far I would go. Oh, or the masochists. Either way. Oh, is my favorite Shakespeare play is Titus Andronicus. Hmm. Interesting. The the sto- which the climax has has the protagonist trick his rival into eating him into eating his own parents after they were baked into a meat pie. Oh, so that's where Cartman got that from. Yep. As a macabre form of ta- of taunting him, and even beyond that, Titus Andronicus is is messed up, is a messed up play. It sounds like it. I, I I'm sorry. I, I I don't know if I would go to that extreme to like take uh, revenge on my enemies if I have any I wouldn't, enemies. I wouldn't go that far personally, but it, but just in the sense of. Going through these meticulous plans just to me- just to mess with somebody is something I would do, because because I've done because I have done it. Oh. I mean, yeah, I would. I would. There's a lot of things that I would do specifically just to make a person mad. Yeah. But golly, I would not. But, <laughs> I, I would not bake their their parents into a pie. No, um, I did. I did um sw- I did switch someone's Hershey bar once so that in- so in so uh, instead of a regular Hershey bar it was a bar of baking chocolate. I don't know how I would feel about that. It's unsweetened, so it's really I, really I, bitter. I know, I know, I, but because my taste buds are so weird, I've probably been like, eh, this candy bar sucks. <laughs> Huh. <laughs> I would that would have been the extent of it. I wouldn't have reacted extreme or anything. I think I think in one other instance I um I took a I took a syringe full of water and injected it into the foam part of somebody's um desk chair. Oh no. <laughs> so you you sit down and you, and all of a sudden you have to ex- and then you have to explain why there's this giant wet spot on your pants. I just pissed myself and I don't know. How. <laughs> <laughs> um I've I had built uh, an old classic is building a program to open up the CD open up the CD tray every ninety seconds, just to uh, trigger would, someone's OCD. That would piss me off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then then you close it, and then ninety seconds later it opens right back up. That's but, probably one of the reasons why I don't have a disk drive. <laughs> but the the thing with the the thing with the coffee that's I consider that my masterpiece because I I made. I switched the coffee with decaf. I switched the sugar with salt. I switched the creamer with um, unsweetened coconut milk. Who wronged you? Who wronged you? <laughs> I have a cho- I have a chocolate allergy. I can't have chocolate oh. at all. And awesome. one of my coworkers thought it'd be real funny to leave a chocolate cake on my desk on my birthday. What an asshole! <laughs> <laughs> what an <laughs> asshole! And he's, he's like, "What are you gonna do about it?" And I'm like. I could hit you, but you'd but you'd get out of the hospital in a few weeks. So I'm I'm gonna get creative with you. And my res- my response to being creative was messing with the coffee to the point that when I came when I came back from con- from a convenient vacation, uh, there was a memo that basically said basically said that I am banned from the coffee machine without supervision. Oh, you went full con. It's like I don't want to kill you, Kirk. I want to hurt you. <laughs> Keep hurting you. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd, I'm the type of person who who would go. You know what? I could kill you for this, but I can only do that once. But <laughs> and this, yeah. is it? This is a bad time to mention that one of my favorite movies is Ocean's Eleven, like the the remake that we got in two thousand. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking that I was thinking too, like as you know, my philosophy was always that if you you don't want to kill anybody, because if you kill them, they don't learn anything. Mm-hmm. Usually, if you hurt somebody or put if you if you deal some form of retribution in a way to where they learn their lesson, 
and not learn not to fuck with you anymore. I, I feel that to be more beneficial. Mm -hmm. Now, one th one thing that I um, because I I couldn't help but notice that a while back you were you were streaming your experiences with um, Bloodstained, and I obviously have my own experiences with it, but mm -hmm. um. I'm guess I'm guessing you're I'm guessing you're as much of a seasoned person with Castlevania as I am. I mean, you already, yeah. you already laughed about the whole the whole thing with the with the Medusa heads, but I will I will admit something a little a little controversial. Um, I know a lot of people really hate Lords of um, Lords of Shadow. Okay. I hate what it became. Explain. One of the one of the common complaints that Lords of Shadow got was it being too linear. Okay. That it that it wasn't that it was that it wasn't um it wasn't taking the it wasn't doing full openness a la a a la a, a la Symphony of the Night. Okay. Which would be a fair comparison to make if that was Mercury Steam's goal. They had they had specifically cited as one of their big inspirations was. Super Castlevania 4. Oh, that makes sense. That makes a whole hell of a lot more sense than I thought. I always felt with the uh, Mercury Steam Castlevania games, I thought they were great God of War games, but they weren't really what I was expecting out of a Castlevania. Well, it was it was meant it was meant to try and be a a uh, a full a full on a full on reboot, not a not a soft not a um soft reboot kind of thing. Yeah, but well, especially with the uh, um the the problem that happened was after after the first game and was um was was when Kojima ended up getting himself run out of Konami, and oh, Ko cool. and Kojima Productions was was basically protecting the, basically protecting Mercury Steam from the rest of Konami. I see. Which is, and then after that, Mirror of Fate and Lords of Shadow Two came around that were trying to do more of the um, the the Metroidvania approach. But I've I've always res I've always resented this idea that you have to do a Metroidvania like if you're doing Castlevania, for instance. That's not to say you. That's not to say don't do it. But if you're gonna, mm -hmm. but do it for the right reasons. That being because you actually want to and not. Out of some obligation, yeah, and I've seen I've seen cases where they've deviated from the formula and it actually worked out. Ladybug, uh, Team Ladybug, actually is probably one of the best examples of that with uh, D Lit and Wonder Labyrinth. Mm -hmm. Like that's such a different take on a Metroidvania, like putting it in chapters and actually short, like shrinking down the uh, the map and like D Lit and Wonder Lab. I will I will note a couple of things. One, um, that for, late, that was Ladybug's second foray into Metroidvania. Yeah, I have Toho Luna Nights, but I have not played it yet. Uh, but there's also the the game the Castlevania entry that Deedlet reminded me the most of was Order of Ecclesia. Oh, I love that game so much. Like I, I went out of my way. Well, what was it? I found it in a secondhand gaming store, and I went out of my way to get it. And I, when I played it, I played through it on the. But by the time I got it, I had a 3ds, so I put it on. Uh, I played it on a 3ds, and it was so unconventional that it was just intriguing. Mm -hmm. To the point, of, like even the, uh, was it just the the amount of levels of OP you could possibly be by the end of the game. To where I was like two shotting Dracula. <laughs> it's like this it's so anticlimactic, but at the same time it's like that the fact that you could just just roll into Dracula's chamber and just use that beam sword thing mm -hmm. on him and take him out. I was like, well well that was a thing. <laughs> yeah. And the thing, but th I'd say a good, I'd say a, a good, a good example of of so of something that really should really shouldn't have been doing that me that um, Metroidvania approach. Oddly, I know I know some people are gonna give are gonna give me shit for this, but 
I um, I honestly think that both Lament of Innocence and Curse of Darkness should have gone a, should have gone a level based approach. I I really do want to play Curse of Darkness at some point. I feel well, I being Castlevania three being like one of my favorite games in the series. So I, I don't know how, why I have such a fondness for that game, but it's probably because that's the one game my dad and I both enjoyed playing together. I like Curse of Darkness, but it did suffer the misfortune of com of coming out around this of coming out in the round in the same fr time frame as Chaos Legion. Oh yeah, I do own Chaos Legion, which, which is another kind of Devil May Cry ish uh, game. Oh, it 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 outright it outright had some of the some of the Devil May Cry staff working on it. Yeah, yeah, which that's that makes the most sense. And well, there's always this discussion that Bloody and I had when we were talking on our show about uh, DMC Devil May Cry. Had they have not made that a uh, had it not had the the Devil May Cry brand on it, if they would have just said, "Okay, this is uh, Chaos Legion 2, that game probably might have been received better than it was. If I'm being honest, if there's anything that feels like Chaos Legion 2, it's Astral Chain. I can I can believe that at at least in terms of a of being a spiritual successor in terms of the gameplay loop. Oh, Astral Chain's Astral Chain's so good. Mm -hmm. Well, I got that's another game. Now that I have a lot of downtime, I'm looking for looking at what games I want to play, and I might actually I have Astral Chain. I got a bunch of backlog that I need to go through anyway. Yeah. So, but the thing. Now the big re the big reason I, s I say this with L with lament of in with lament of innocence is mm -hmm. the story is the story that it's attempting to tell. There's mm -hmm. also the, there's also the fact that trying trying to do trying to do a three a trying to do a full th a full three D castle the way you'd see in Castlevania is going to have navigational issues. Mm -hmm. Like you. The complexity of a castle in the 2D Castlevania games, you can get away with that because you're only dealing with two dimensions. Yes. Once you're dealing with three dimensions and you're dealing with verticality and you're dealing with angles, that's where things get a lot more get a lot more complicated. Yeah, and the 64 you, game, basically. And you need to have you need to have some sort of hub system. This is this is why I don't mind say how Metroid Prime handled handled its map design. Because Actually, it did, because them. it did have a hub system. Yeah, to another extent, uh, the the earlier Souls games, like like uh, Demon Souls, kind of had that hub system. In it it made everything a little bit easier to tend to. Even mm -hmm. though it was every, I feel like Dark Souls was the pinnacle of that, like uh, just perfection of that format. Yeah, Demon Demon Souls had to cr had to crawl so Dark Souls could run, and yes. Even even to that extent, I do, I do think that I do I do think that more people should take a, at least a historian's look at the Kingsfield series. I actually uh, I got a Steam Deck for Christmas, and I've been putting emulators all over that damn thing, and uh, I noticed that the, a lot of the Kingsfield games were like just available for mm -hmm. or to put on there, and. I'm, I'm kind of conflicted. Cause I'm like, do I want to put myself through uh, earlier game development navigation? But at the same time, it's like I'm so into the Soul series. It's probably one of the uh, biggest series that I I, I kind of enjoy playing. That I do want to look back and see what started it. Because mm -hmm. Demon Souls was outright stated to be a spiritual successor to Kingsfield. Yeah, I can see it. And there was there was there was one game that there was one in between game that kind of that kind of kind of dipped into mat into matters known as Eternal Ring, which isn't bad. It's just kind of weird. Although I saw that, uh, I, I saw that game like on the shelves at uh, at Blockbuster like a, a bunch of times, and I really wanted to get it, but like I felt like. What if I didn't like it? Even though I was in like a heavier RPG, it was a heavy JRPG phase at that time. I will note as a bit of an aside, I and you you've probably seen this if you've seen some of my previous work. I'm not a fan of the phrase JRPG. Mm. Uh, the big the big reason for that is 
the name the name JRPG tells me nothing. It's the same thing, but just you're adding a letter on top of it. Well, here's here's the the term, and I may as well also throw the term WRPG. All oh, that it yeah. tells me is the is the or is the or is the origin, mm-hmm. and it doesn't it doesn't infer and it doesn't infer any sort of ga- any sort of gameplay mechanic. And when people have said, well, it infers turn based, except. Except if that's the case, then why why are the Tales games considered JRPGs? I was gonna say it's uh, maybe that term is a little too vague. I, when the, I think of uh, the WRPGs. term that the term that I use uh-huh. the, in to that I feel I feel is I feel is a bit more apropos for both the history and for what they do is mm-hmm. console style and PC style. Uh, I see, because I yeah when I think of uh, let's say there was that point where people were like kind of taking a dump on a lot of the Japanese style games and they were propping up a lot of the games like say uh uh Mass Effect and uh all, the, all those Kotor. yeah yeah and that 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 whole thing aged like milk <laughs> <laughs> yeah it did I was like it, it's all games dude why are you even why are we even doing this if I'm being if I'm being honest, I th- I think the JRPG WRPG thing was something that was manufactured by both journalists and by the and by the PR team of of um of say Microsoft, Large, largely because for the longest time, um Japan basically owned the console market, and yeah. then the 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 Xbox was qu- was quaint, but the Xbox 360 was where the was where the blue was where the um, footprint really set in. Yeah, yeah, and I, I th- believe that. And I think because of that, a lot a lot of people in both the media and the PR end of things were thinking that they were the big swing and dick now. And to Boy, be fair, did. the eight the um there was a lot of upheaval with the shift to HD, and a lot of companies could not adapt. Yeah, the... and that was that was around the same time too. Is like uh, Phil Fish was basically going on in on a lot of Japanese games, despite the fact that his ge- despite the fact that his game was clearly taking cues from Mario. Yep, if you could even call it his game, because I I want to say that Fez actually there was more than just him working on Fez, but oh. he was just the public face of it. Yeah, the, much like how. Rem- a lot of people give um, give Inafune cre- credit for Mega Man, but he what? But he wasn't the actual father of Mega Man. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, what was it? The same thing could be said about uh, Sakamoto with Metroid. Mm-hmm. They went with uh, well, I guess Gunpei Yokoi kind of took the uh, the public credit for Metroid, even though Sakamoto was involved and a, a handful of other developers. And then Sakamoto claimed that he was the father of Metroid when, in reality, there was. It was a group effort, and of course, the nadir of this is um John, is the way John the way um John Romero acted when it came to Doom. Yeah, he's sent he sent he's obviously obviously mellowed out, and he and he has a sense of humor about the whole thing, especially after his humbling in the form of Daikatana. But <laughs> the big oh boy. but the big reason why. I, now this it really did it really didn't dawn on me until years ago when extra credits did their th- did their um thing about the history of RPGs and managed to get so much wrong. The reason why I use the phrase console style and, and PC style has to do with the origins of both. Uh, a lot of what's considered JRPGs comes from Dragon Quest. Yes. Dragon Quest was an attempt to take the take the um computer RPG scene that was that was starting to really take really um take off in in Japan especially with how popular um wizardry was yeah and do a simplified version for the family computer i.e. Famicom and yep. a lot of the DN, a lot of stuff that's in um console style RPGs to this day has it has its cues from Dragon Quest especially the um field town dungeon loop yeah, I uh, that was it's funny when I got into uh, RPGs. I think the I had at the time I was kind of involved in like a chat room based uh, RPG, and that was all oh, 
one of those things where I kind of fumbled into eventually like running that that thing and I was kind of thrown into it with no experience and then kind of to help me out with that I decided to play like Dragon Quest so Dragon Quest was probably one of the earliest RPGs that I played I would argue that I did play Shining Force 2 before that but tactical RPGs is an entirely different uh, thing altogether and on the, in the same vein, when it comes to the phrase PC style, well, a lot, a lot of the a lot of the early the earliest attempt at that kind of thing could would could probably be either the either the um, D and D application on the Plato engine in the seventies, mm-hmm. or Zork. Even though Zork was isn't tech is more of a adventure game than than an R, an RPG. Kind of missed like. Mm-hmm. Of, in a very primitive sense, yes, uh, and the for, the t- multi-user dungeons or muds were were um somewhat based were based on dungeon D U N G E N, which was an unlicensed um version of Zork. Yeah, I've heard of that. But extra credits tried to claim that JRPGs descended from visual novels, which is completely wrong, especially oh. since <laughs> especially since. Um, Enix was Enix was making um, vis- was making visual novel stuff like the um, he- like the Hilo Meki si- series mm-hmm. um, on P- on PC Engine. Actually, actually, no, it was Square who made that the same year that they put out the original Final Fantasy. Yeah, oh, it was what was that eighty seven? I believe. Yeah, eighty seven. Those were though there was there was an installment on that in in the, in the same ye- in the same year, and. The the development of visual novels just has has nothing to as there's no relation to that in RPGs whatsoever, so I'm not entirely sure where extra credits had gotten that. But then again, they fell off hard over the years. Yeah, I wonder if it's like one of their staff like had encountered Radical Dreamers and kind of just tried to piece together a narrative based off of that or something. I am glad to see that Radical Dreamers is now of, is now available in a way that people can play because that's what that was one of my white whales for, for the longest time. That and um, Sword World. I remember uh, was it via emulation uh, going through Radical Dreamers, and I thought that was like I felt like I was finding forbidden knowledge when I played that. Yeah, I can I can certainly I can certainly see that, but the reason why I use the why I use um, console style and PC style is because of, because of those origins. I can inf- I can infer certain play styles when okay. I when I see those genres because for me when I see a genre, when I see a game is meant is meant to be in a certain genre much like when I see that a, that a certain band is in a certain genre. There's connections that that I that can be formed. Like if I hear yeah. if I hear that a gr- that a group is a melodic death metal band, for in- for instance, I'm gonna have some ideas on what they're gonna sound like. If they're a pro- if they're a progressive metal band, like say Dream Theater, they're probably gonna have long a- long ass songs. Yeah, like at least a, a good fifteen to twenty minute like interlude or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that same principle applies to video games. If if I see that if I see that a game is an arena shooter, then I think I've got an idea on how it's going to handle maps, how it's going to handle weapons, and how it's going to handle multiplayer. Mm-hmm. If I if I see that a game is a um, is a throwback FPS, then I've got some ideas on how that's then how it's going to work. Um, I know some people might say that that it that would play that it play like Doom, but a lot of a lot of what's being called boomer shooters these days don't limit themselves to Doom. In fact, fa- in, f- in fact, the one of the patient zeros for the idea, um, Dusk, has more in common with Qu- has more in common with Quake, but even and Blood, but even that's stretching things a little bit. Yeah, I always thought the the term boomer shooter was so odd. For <laughs> I was like, you know, I as somebody that plays those types of shooters, and I, I grew up on those types of shooters. I never really considered it a like an old man's game or anything like that. I was, I, I'm I guess, guess. 
I'm guessing oh, go they go. I'm guessing they went with it because call, because calling it throwback FPS is too long. Probably. It, it's just because. Uh, well, I mean, a lot of the modern shooters are what third person. Because yeah, I guess people, uh, if you're into Fortnite or if you're into like uh, those types of games, I don't know. It's so it's so weird. I mean, considering the fact that Doom 2016 is still solid, it, and I haven't played Eternal yet because I'm still trying to work my way through six, 2016. So I'm trying to 100% the hell out of that game. So mm-hmm. <laughs> it might take me a while. Oh, well, Rome wasn't built in a day. Mm. But especially with the way I procrastinate. Yeah. <laughs> Were, was it you that I saw at the 1917 procrastinators convention last week? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> but uh, I'm a mess. <laughs> at least confession confession is good is is the first step on the road to recovery. No, I can agree with that. But like I, I look at a, I'll use I'll use for example that the uh, some of the, some of the stuff that new that new blood has put has put out. Um, I already I already mentioned dusk. Um, a medieval feels more feels more like heretic. Um, okay. Ion Ion uh, Maiden. I am not calling it Ion Fury. Fuck you, Iron Maiden. You would you would have if it weren't for them thro- if it weren't for three D realm throwing in the towel you would have lost that court case. But Ion Fury feels like it's got DNA of um, Shadow Warrior and um, Sin. Yeah. Oh my God, Sin. And its successor, Phantom Fury, feels blatantly like Sin to the point where they actually got Blade in the in the trailer for the thing, which which made me flip out. I thought it was funny too because there's supposed to be a uh, a remaster of Sin. The, I, oh, that's I, that's already out. I'm not sure if they also covered the Sin episodes, which. Honestly, I honestly I I'm not gonna miss. I was uh, gonna say like not too many people really like the Sin episodes, but the the game itself was pretty highly revered when it came out. Mm-hmm. But then and then you've got then um then you've got then you've got then you've got um what was it um cultic which feels like a chunkier version of blood. <laughs> Mm. Although, although, although there's a bunch, there's a bunch of crazy. There's although with even more crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, there was um, po- there was postal brain damage, which feels like a fever dream. <laughs> I feel then like again, I should probably get more of the post, get the postal games. Uh, I'm not going to say that any of the postal games are good, although the the one that you're not going to be able to get is Postal Three, and there's very good reason for it. Yeah, didn't they uh, basically say, we're, "Hey, we're sorry for three. <laughs> for 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 a bit of time, it was available on their website before they took it off because mm-hmm. they wanted to make a they wanted to make a sequel to Postal Two, but they didn't have the budget f- to actually do the development, so they handed things off to a, a rush to a Russian developer. Um, I think it was. I think they were called Arkelu. Okay. But then, but then, then the economic situation in Europe happened, and they and instead of the A team, they you essentially had the C team working on the game, and Ooh. it was so, it was so bad that um ru- that running with scissors pub- has repeatedly and publicly disowned it, and even in Postal Four, they take pot shots at it. Yeah, I remember the. Uh... I just remember the uh, we're sorry for Postal Three, and and then them putting it uh, like, hey, if you want it, it's on the our site or whatever. I remember that. So I I want to say even with Steam, they were just like, yeah, fuck it, you can have it for free. <laughs> yeah, and the and when when they when they did the early access for Postal Four, they had they had promised it's not going to suck like Postal Three. I like the fact that they they just kind of owned it and it's like eh yeah it sucked. <laughs> There's too many like companies that just they'll either try to gaslight you into thinking that no this 
this is actually really good. You you should, should just not playing it right. You just don't understand the uh, the the lore and the the complicate. Or is it you have to have a high IQ to understand this game? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they de they they de they delisted the th they delisted the ga the game. And they the and had stated it was out of that it was out of the best interest of the postal community, which. Fair. And is, I guess I guess you can always go to a vaporware site and like grab it if you really are that so inclined to want to play it. If you're if you're a masochist. <laughs> I I am. Don't tease me. <laughs> if anyone's that curious, I just tell them go go watch Civvy's review of it, review of it, and you'll pretty much get you'll pretty much get the gist. I thought you were going to say, go watch the movie. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, but the movie... Yeah, but the the movie... Well, the movie is an Uwe Boll thing. One that, yeah. one that has... Ter one that doesn't even, doesn't even dub the voices properly. <sighs> yeah, I, uh, you ever I seen too... you ever seen a you ever seen a bad B movie where it where it's like the where it's like the audio is just is just half a second off? I watched a lot of Shaw Brothers films, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Whenever that happens, I feel like I'm I'm slowly going insane. <laughs> oh, I hate that. Like, uh, there's times I'll watch movies, uh, streaming movies, and Pluto is notorious for this, where they. They'll in the middle of the movie something will happen with uh it'll hiccup and the dialogue's off and I'm just like, well I just completely lost interest in this. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, although speaking speaking of that speaking of that kind of thing, I have, I've had, I've the localization debate has has sparked up and I have my own perspective on that. I'm willing to hear it. Um, because. I am fu I am fully I am fully aware that lo that um tra that translation is not an easy task. I ended up learning that the hard way when I tried to coordinate a um, fan translation attempt for Anima Beyond Fantasy. Okay. Which is where which is where I where where I very quickly learned that there is a galaxy of difference between Mexican Spanish, which I had which I had some passing understanding of, and Spain Spanish. Oh yeah! Don't don't ever tell somebody. <laughs> that there's no difference between that they'll hurt you <laughs> people will die for that or die on that and hill anima <laughs> comes anima is a spanish ttrpg okay and a lot of it a lot of it was was tr was trying to was trying to coordinate and that's that's how i ended up that's how i ended up learning that kind of thing the hard way mm -hmm. especially since some 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 of the people in spain look at um mexican spanish as um backwards hicks for yeah lack of a I've, better had, term. Uh, I've had uh both types of uh co-workers and like i've i've known people that they they were ready to ball me up over like using the word his, uh hispanic <laughs> it was like just even that w was like just insulting to them so i was like oh okay what, what would you like to be called <laughs> Um. Now with now with that in, with that in mind with the with, <laughs> the with that with that in mind um I've been I've been trying for the longest time it was like pulling teeth to try and find decent translations of Japanese tabletop games as I mentioned before Sword World which is the bit which is the big homegrown entry in the Japanese tabletop scene. Mm -hmm. Is was um was a white whale for me for years. Nowadays, I, ma I I managed. Nowadays, I found a group that not only translated the core material, but have translated several supplements. Okay. And sort and um because of that, I was the one voice of reason when people were like, "Why does this Goblin Slayer TTRPG not use D and D?" I mean, they use D they use D and D in the light novel. The reason is D and D doesn't have that much of a doesn't have as big of a foothold in Japan. Yeah. Sword World is the one that the two the two that have the biggest footholds for the for the longest time have been Sword World and Call of Cthulhu. 
that's the one thing I never really well I, I feel is interesting when I'm in forums or if I that one random time I decide to go on Reddit again I'm a masochist uh, but just there's a lot of people that make that argument without understanding that there's a, a huge cultural differences and that being there's they don't they didn't grow up with the same things that we grew up with or a lot of things that are cultural phenomena like here weren't necessarily the same over there. Um, it's a it's a case of is a case of think of thinking that that D and D is the entirety of tabletop gaming and not realizing that there there is a spectrum so there is a spectrum so wide and vast that I can that I cannot possibly summarize. <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of I, the like the Amerocentricism uh, argument with a lot of uh, politically minded posts or whatever. Yeah. So that, but what I but um what I ended the part of the reason why part of the reason why it's why it's taken so long to get to get pro, to get proper translations aside from aside from indie tabletop projects like Ma- like Made or the game I'm cur- the game I'm currently covering on the show Convictor Drive is there's a lot more stuff that you have there's a lot more stuff that you have to translate mm-hmm. and. The, and trans and translate in di- in different f- in different forms, but that being that being said, I will o- I will always argue that uh, if you're if you're tr- if you're trying to bring a wor- a work into another language, you have you have to you have to realize that you're not the writer in this, and. For me, the for me the problem that I have with a lot of people who want to creatively add creatively add things into translations is for one those things are going are going to age like milk, mm-hmm. and two, what people want is the same what people want ideally is the same experience as what a native speaker would get. And exactly this was this was the thing I had, this was the thing I had said that got that got me banned from one particular group. I said. How would you react if me- if memes were put into a translation of Roadside Picnic? Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, when I had done my video on it, uh, the way I explained it to you was like, would you rather have the, just as a localized uh, analogy, would you rather have the original version of RoboCop 1989 or the made for TV version. Let me ra- let me raise you one. Which version would you ra- which version would you rather have of, of these? The theatrical version of Heaven's Gate mm-hmm. or the Criterion version? Hmm. It really depends on the well, I would go I'm a purist at heart, so the Criterion want- version is the is the pure one. The MGM one yeah. was well, it had a lot of cuts and that infamous piss filter, which is what got the film its infamous reputation. Oh yeah, yeah. So as, as I don't have a lot of Criterion one uh, films, but like I tend to lean into. Well, it, it, I guess honestly, uh, it we can use Legend for as a, a reference for that too because the the legend uh the anniversary edition had the director's cut which has uh it's an entirely different movie altogether mm-hmm. and i enjoy both but i grew up on the theatrical cut so yeah that's if i I'm... if i have if i have to use an, if i have to use another example there's a reason why people made a big deal about finally being able to get the get their hands on the original macross yeah, that's true. And because um, I guess Har- I think Harmony, Harmony Gold, Gold. Had, fi- had finally seen the writing on the wall, especially since they- especially since it was more more and more unlikely that their um attempt at doing a live action Robotech movie was going to get was going to get off the ground, especially when the di- the director and the writer that they had saddled for it uh, went on to work on other things. The writer would would um would jump would jump ship onto Kingsman. Mm-hmm. I don't remember what happened with with the director, and there was also the public pantsing they got over the whole BattleTech situation, where they tr- they tried to claim that um, the BattleTech game by Harebrain Schemes had reused had um u- had used some of the unseen mechs as th- as they're known. Oof. 
but the point the point is is that pe is that people are going to people are going to want the authentic experience and the other thing that i brought up was mm -hmm. let's re let's reverse this situation do you think somebody living in Japan? Do you think somebody living in Japan would want a, would want um, would want the would want jokes from Japanese comedians showing up while they're wa while they're watching Rick and Morty or something? No, they well, yeah, going off of like uh, just like just everybody, it, I, it, it is a universal thing. You want to experience somebody's culture, and you want it in the most authentic way possible. Mm-hmm. And I know for I know for a fact that when it when it when it came when it came to something like um, when it came to something like roadside picnic, that I that a lot of people have told me that there isn't there that there's a bunch of things that kind of got guffed in a lot of the translations, which I'm not going to fault anybody for because Russia is not an easy language to translate into English. Mm. Um. But the f there was that mask off moment where some where somebody had said that their that their translators not robots because the, because a lot of a lot of the people who are in that localization crowd mm -hmm. seem to have gotten in their heads that they that they are writers themselves. Yeah, they think that they're more uh, wittier than the source material, and I hate to break it to them, they're not. <laughs> Or that, or that they need, or the whole modern audiences thing, which um, the problem. Yet the, to find a modern audience. <laughs> it it doesn't it does not exist. It's it it is about as is about as reliable as um as the as the monster under the closet. Mm -hmm. Not 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 under the closet. What the hell am I saying? Under, under the bed. Under the bed. Well, even even then, like a monster under the closet, it sounds. About as plausible as the the phantom audience that they're looking for, both are non-existent. Mm. <laughs> but there is there, and a lot a lot of the, a lot of and oddly enough, they do they they will do this while at the same time um, lamba lambasting people who pirate while creating a situation that is going to make people want to pirate. Yeah, I I think this is the main reason why people will go to scan later's before or scan later's and like uh, look uh, basically uh, teams that come in and and break anime into uh, or translation teams or whatever because I, I I favor a lot of the old school uh, translation teams over a lot of these uh, as uh, as do. Kids. As do as do I, and there there's one particular instance where I can, where um because of how it was guffed, and it was it wasn't guffed in some sort of social justice way, but just pure incompetence. Mm -hmm. That I can't I, that as good as as good as the show is, I cannot recommend someone go with the official release, and that is Thunderbolt Fantasy. I can see that. Well, I, I, obviously, Hanlon's Razor applies to a lot of. I, I would say at least most of the things that are going on right now. Yeah, there's a lot more incompetence like at play than. I, I, I know some of these people can be malicious, and they're probably exhibiting malicious tendencies, but they're too incompetent to like follow through in a way that lets them get away with it. Mm -hmm. But the reason the reason why I say it is, for context, Thunderbolt Fantasy is. A P is a is a collaboration between Tiwanese um pu Tiwanese puppet theater company Peely mm -hmm. and Nitro Plus, you know, again Urobuchi's company, and Urobuchi is the is the is the main writer for for this. Though there is, there isn't as much of the Uro Butcher because he's he's kind of dialed that back ever since the days of Common Rider Gaim. but. The the key thing is that the version that you're gonna, that you would be watching, wh whether it's official or unofficial, is the Japanese dub of a Taiwanese puppet theater production. Yeah, I've seen clips of those, and well, oh, it's really dope just to like see some of that stuff. I, it's come a long way from like say Thunderbolts. Oh yeah, oh yes. But for what now? Because of the because of that fact, all the all the dub actors are um are are Japanese seiyu, 
And in fact, mm-hmm. in, in fact, if you look at the Seiyu cast, it's pretty damn star-studded. Yes, okay. a lot of a lot of them had a lot of them have worked on Fate, but again, Genrobuchi's company, so he's going to bring in people he knows. Okay. But for whatever reason, the official the official um release that that can be found on Crunchyroll uses the ta- uses the Taiwanese um versions of char- of characters names instead of instead of the Japanese versions of those names that you're going to be hearing. Interesting. I have no idea why this was done. It was a very stupid move because the names you're going to be seeing in the text and the names you're going to be hearing aren't going to match and that's going to get real confusing to the point where the fan base has created nicknames for all the characters. It couldn't have been for like any legal reasons because it's not like JoJo's where it, like most of the stand names have to be like slightly altered for fear of being sued into oblivion. No, it isn't what it isn't one of those one of those situations. And because of because of that, I usually tell people, don't watch the official release. Watch the fan subs. Uh, of course, in, in some ca- in some cases, I've I've seen some official releases that complete that completely um completely completely mi- completely miss some some um some wordplay jokes because well Japan loves wordplay. Yeah, they're very pun heavy. Uh, like did did you ever see Zetsubo Sensei? I don't think so. I've I'm slowly getting back into anime again. Mm-hmm. Like I I've been I've kind of been in and out here and there. I think the a lot of it is just the emotional intensity cuz I think Gurren Lagann kind of broke me for for like a straight year and I was like I it's, it's too much of an emotional roller coaster for me to invest in another yeah. series, but that was like back in like what 2000s 2008 or whatever. Yeah. And but uh the on, thing, the thing with Sensible Sensei, which is which is a comedy work. Okay. Um every character's name is some is some sort of is some sort of writing or or spoken gag. Okay. Or some or some some sort of pun. The prote- the protagonist has the nickname Zetsubo Sensei because if you write if you write his care if you write his name vertically instead of horizontally, um, his name his name has his name looks like the char- one of the characters for his name looks like the character for despair. Okay. Which is also why he insists on writing his name vertically every chance he gets, so people don't bring it up. But edgy boy. <laughs> Uh, but well, I wouldn't say he's edgy. Is more is more that he ta- he takes the worst um, interpretation of everything, and then and then says that it's driven him to despair. Oh, like, so it's kind of like a personality quirk. Yeah, like and like like I said, it's a it's a comedy. Uh, but it's a comedy in the in the in a in much in the same way as. Azamanga Dio or Cromartie High School, where it's a comedy, but it's also cracked out. Yeah, uh, I, I, I know one of my coworkers had like suggested Cromartie High because he's like, "Well, there's a robot and there's a Freddie Mercury's in it," and I'm like, "Well, I like both. Of, I like robots and Freddie Mercury. I might watch this." Um, I should note the the robot is voiced by Norio Wakamoto, who it who is the premier vi- who for the longest time was the premier villain voice if you need if you needed a big epic villain for your anime that that sounds awesome actually his <laughs> his big his biggest cl- his biggest claim to fame was being the voice of cell oh that was okay. that was that was his that was his big that was his big breakout um no i am familiar with his voice then japanese i've I oh, I listened to or was it when I play uh, Dragon Ball Fighters or when I did I prefer the Japanese. I'm not sure uh, if he did. I'm not sure if he did the voice for for Cell in Fighters. Fighters. Okay. I watched. Uh, I, I I lucked out back in the '90s because uh, one of my best friends she was she's half Japanese, but she's a military brat, so she had a lot of her family members had sent stuff over. Mm-hmm. So I wound up getting, uh, I want to say, the ten coupons for Dragon Ball Z from the Saiyan Saga all the way up to the beginning of the Cell Saga, 
And then I actually had a tape of uh, a friend of mine loaned me a tape of the, I want to say the Majin Buu saga. Yeah. Or like some of the tail end of that. So I got to see that. And, and there was no subtitles though. So I, it was all interpretation at the time. Yeah. I, um, I do remember, I do remember. I, I've I've spoken with I've spoken with a lot of people who had who broke who broken in the in those early days. Um, I've I've had it on my bucket list that one of these days I want it, I want to talk with with um, Mike Pondsmith. Oh, yeah, that would be a good interview actually. Uh, I've had I've had people from our Telsorian games on, but but I haven't been able to get Pondsmith, and I do, and I think it's going to be a while before I get that level of lucky. I was gonna say it, it. It might take you a while, but I, you email him. I'm sure he'll probably. I have. I, I, I've. I've had. I've talked with the. I've talked with the social. With the um. With the meet. With the. With with representatives from Artel Sorian. So I've been able to get some stories, um, secondhand. Um, okay. One of the, one of them was some some of the details with his experience working with CD Projekt Red and the fact that. They were massive fans of Cyberpunk to the point where they had pay- they had paid for his flight to Poland. Um, That's awesome. There was, and it was actually his son who talked him into doing the doing a TTRPG of the Witch of the Witcher with him. Because okay. the the idea was pitched to him, but he was kind of iffy on it since he hadn't done anything fantasy related since Castle Falkenstein, and that was mm. that was like I want to. S- I keep thinking ninety two, but don't quote me on that. Point is, it was a while, and his son, his son, his son barged in. It was like, "Dad, we got to do this," and it it's obviously got more in common with the games than it does with the novels, more, mostly because of the CD Projekt Red relationship, and also because um, Andre Sapkowski is kind of a douche. I could see it. <laughs> well, you probably heard about the royalty story, didn't you? I heard uh, heard bits and pieces of the royalty story. That he, whole thing um, was just kind of a mess. He tried. He tried to. He tried to sue. Over, he tried to sue CD Projekt Red over un, over unpaid royalties or something like that. Mm-hmm. But CD Projekt Red was like, we we talked about we talked about this when the whole project started you want you wanted a lump sum now even though you mm-hmm. wouldn't get real, even though you wouldn't get a sales percentage afterwards and we offered you we offered that to you twice and you told us to pound sand it's, yeah that that was that was kind of a huge fumble on his part it's like well I guess historically that's happened with a lot of people what was it Colonel Sanders kind of did the same thing and he, had he actually invested in, or like uh, taken the stock options that he was given, uh, he probably would have been much more wealthier than he, he ended up as. Because mm-hmm. he, there he was given. T- there were two options he was given. Option A, you take a you take a lump amount now, and that's the end of it. Option mm-hmm. B, you don't take a lump amount now, but you take a percentage of the game's sales. He was like, "Give me my money now and get and get the fuck out." That was with the I, first game. My the, understanding of that is he probably thought that uh, it wasn't going to go anywhere. It was just he kinda... does not respect video games yeah. as a storytelling medium. He's made that very clear. Uh, jokes on him. <laughs> and he and um, when Witcher Two came out, CD Projekt Red approached him with the same offer: "Do you want do you want a lump sum now, or do you want or do you want a percentage?" And he was like, "Lump sum now, fuck off." Yep. And their mindset when he did this lawsuit was, "What the fuck are you doing?" I do remember the writer of the Metro series, who is the complete opposite of this, chiming in and suspecting that it was actually his wife who was put who was pushing this kind of thing. Yeah, I can see With, that. With there was the implication that his wife was the one who was wearing the pants in the relationship, if you know what I mean. That that's not uncommon. Especially when it comes to never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, I don't want you to say anything that's going to get you on the couch. I was going to say, well, she just went upstairs, so she's fine. Oh, <laughs> never mind. Uh, <laughs> but, but thank you so much. But you the the um, thing 
the the part of the reason that I part of the reason that I find those those early experiences interesting, especially in the case of Pondsmith, is Pondsmith is was kind of a pioneer when it came to bringing um, weebness into tabletop. Not just with Cyberpunk, and in fact, Cyberpunk is the, Cyberpunk has the least of that, mm-hmm. but also stuff like Teenagers from Outer Space, which he. Um, f- which which he outright outright has admitted was heavily inspired by Rumiko Takahashi's work, um, especially Yatsura. That makes sense. Um, Mekton Zeta, which the inspiration for that was when he would get was when he was getting these Gundam model kits and ha- that were in Japanese and he had no idea what he was doing. Um, and do and doing an, and doing full on adaptations of stuff like Bubblegum Crisis and Armored Trooper Votoms. Oh, that's right. He did do Bubblegum Crisis. Oh. Uh, and because of and for for me the reason I find this interesting is there's been this there's been this mindset for the longest time in the tabletop world that you can that you cannot take inspiration from from manga, from from anime, or from or from video games, and and so on. That's about as boneheaded as the artist notion that uh, uh, you you don't you don't have references and or you don't ever use references, which I always thought was the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Uh, I find I find that anyone who's using the whole you don't use if that's the if that's the case of you don't use references, why is it that every time I commission someone for art of of Aldean? Um, they're always asking me to provide references. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's like a Tumblr artist thing or what, but like it's just so every time I hear people mention that in like a video or something like that, I'm like, get out of here! <laughs> if you don't use references, you'll never grow. So, <laughs> except except that Im- that implies that art is in a is created in a vacuum. Mm. Or any sort, any sort of creative piece. I've I've always had an interest in the chain of events that le- that led to something. Yeah, processes. Yeah, which is which is why, for say RPG history, I I decided to do some digging, and that led me all the way to the D and D application on the um on the Plato servers, which goes that's all the way of, back to the nineteen seventies. Yeah, that's kind of what got me started into just uh, st- working with the full screen boss fight stuff. Mm. Is I I got really I I don't know if it's maybe just the way my head is wired or whatever, but I learning about things was so like just interesting to me that I got really deep into just the the history of video games and the history of all this other stuff, and yeah. I got into so many arguments on forums, and I was like, I need to basically just get my ideas out in somewhere and I started I started a blog in 2008 for a full screen boss fight just mm-hmm. to, to do that and I wandered aimlessly for a couple of years until about 2010 when I started talking about just the business of games and just all these different theories and stuff yeah and a big a big example of of that of that kind of evolutionary chain is a lot of what's considered standard in Dungeons and Dragons is descended from the wargaming scene from mm-hmm. from the 1970s. Yeah, I, I've read about that. Yeah, um, and more, more specifically, descended descended from TSR's previous project, Chainmail, which it's which itself was was born out of again the wargaming scene, especially especially the especially when a lot of people discovered the old Stratego the old Stratego game from the 1890s. Oh, such a blast from the past. Yeah. Well, not this. Your th- the Stratego ga- the Stratego game that you're thinking of is not the one from from that from all those years ago. Just a uh, uh, modified version of it. You're th- you're probably think you're probably thinking of the of the board game with the different with the different ranks that were that had ca- that had castle fronts. That's that's a com- yeah. The only thing that they haven't. Think- yeah, the only thing they have in common is the name. The Stratego game in the in the nineteenth century, which was used by different nations all over Europe, mm-hmm. um, but especially um, especially Prussia, was it was ba- was basically a war game to teach 
to um, teach tactics to um, for um, officers. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, even using a spinning top as a randomizer instead of dice. Um, there. And that that would get that would get adapt that would get adapted into into its into its own takes, and then those adaptations would have would include would start to include a referee system, essentially, well, okay. which is kind of the precursor to the dungeon master as we know it. Interesting. Um, there was a copy of of the rule book in the. In the in the U of M, but it's no longer there. I don't know. I don't know where you could f could find a could find a physical copy. But the the rules have been uh, have been available digitally for years. Uh, I'm trying to, but I've but I would always I would always hear people t people talk about role playing games being too complicated, and they have no idea how good they have it. Um. I will I will not have anyone try and play the um TTRPG version of Alien from from 94. I poof. <laughs> it's one of those things where I would be interested but I don't know if I would put, subject myself through it if it's like that complicated. There is also well if if somebody wants to do Alien in TTRPG form I'll just give them the um one that Free League made a few years ago which is really good. And te and technically speaking, the original one was Strategos, and I had I had the years wrong. It was eighteen eighty. It was actually made by um, Charles Totten for the U.S. Army. Oh, okay. Um, it does it does it does draw upon a on a war gaming genre that was that was in in the Prussian army called um, Kriegsfeld. That wow, that's real bad German. It's okay, my German's not any better. <laughs> yeah. But and and going back even further, you have a bunch of chess derivatives that showed up all over Europe. So you have that chain of you have that chain of events in play. And but for, for the but the Nate one of the big infamous examples of this you can't you can't take inspiration from video games thing was when the Book of Nine Swords came out and I've mentioned the Book of Nine Swords a lot but um it's one it is one of those things that's things that stuck in my craw with how, with how much of a heretic I was for actually liking it. Hmm. As the Book of Nine Swords was an attempt to give martial based characters a bit more to do than just basic attack all the damn time. But some people took issue with it taking inspiration from manga and from video games to the point where they called it Weaboo Fightin' Magic. And that it was <laughs> and that it was stepping on the toes of mages. Which is hilarious to me personally because by the time third edition came around, the mages could made spellcasters in gen in general and clerics especially could be entire parties all by themselves. Like what? Why do you why do you need a thief to 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 open that door when you can use knocks? Why do you why do you need them to roll for, to roll for checking for traps when you can roll, when you can cast detect traps? Why why go out why go out into the field when you can just teleport right to the dungeon? Interesting. I, that's a whole new thing on me because I, I this is my first time actually even hearing about that. Mm -hmm. And the and my my mindset was at at the time. And once again, this was this was me and my big mouth saying saying the truth, but people not wanting to hear the message. You, I had said at the time, you're going to be dealing with a whole new generation of kids. Getting into getting into D and D, or or whichever or whichever other tabletop game they, that they got into, that did not grow up with Tolkien, that did not grow up with Moorcock, that did not grow up with Howard. They they 
they may they may have grown up with they may have grown up with with Rowling. They may have grown up with say the say the Slayers anime. They mm-hmm. may they may have they may have grown up with um with the with the Her, with um Hercules and Xena. Or or the time or some of the more magic some of the um magic set magic centric cartoons that we saw in the 90s. Yeah. And the games that they and the games that they play or or and some of them may end up being designers are going to reflect this. I was so weird cuz I was influenced by I mean I did grow up with Hercules Xena and like uh I did watch Slayers next. That was one of my favorites. But I I just because of like just how I grew up and just the things that are surrounding me, I kind of grew. I fell into Moorcock like just his books while I was looking for inspiration for like that role playing chat that I was running because I I completely lost uh, my motivation to do role play because mm-hmm. I there wasn't enough. I grew up on a lot of sword and sorcery movies and stuff too, you know, like the. A lot of Conan, a lot of like, uh, say, Beastmaster, that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I wanted something like that. So I kind of just jumped into a lot of different things. I, I remember going to go see Thirteenth Warrior when that came out, thinking that that was going to be something that it kind of, it kind of was, but it wasn't. And then uh, I was in Barnes and Noble one day, and I was like, I, I saw the Vanishing Tower, <laughs> and that was my first time seeing that. I was like. Okay, this guy looks really awesome. Like, what what type of stuff is going on? He's got red eyes. He's like pale. He's got this giant black sword. And I got hardcore into that. I think I I got I think I'm missing like one out of those uh, the original series. I can't. Rem- it no, might be the weird weirder the White Wolf. I can't remember. Um. I do. I do know that the de- the designers of the Legacy of Cain games had c- had cited Wheel of Time as one of their big inspirations. But I may I strongly feel that that one that one of the other ones was probably um, Elric. Yeah, was was probably El- was probably the El- what just the Eternal Champion series in as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um. And I I know I know that Razor Fist likes to dismiss The Witcher as being a as being an Elric knockoff. Yeah, but I, yeah. I don't. Th- but I don't think he. I don't. I think he's a bit too arrogant to see the bigger picture on things. The reason I, I, The Witcher was able Razor... to. Oh, sorry. I'm the sorry. reason The Witcher was had taken off in the way that it did mm-hmm. was be, was because of because putting aside the things that it was clearly they're clearly ripping off of Elric, it is so explicitly. Polish, yes. For a for a for and and a a kind of Polish where you're still dealing with the after effects of the Iron Curtain and you're having something that is explicitly uh, theirs. It's kind Instead, of like taking bits and pieces and, and making something new out of it. Yeah, but thing, things like the monsters, thing, things like the like a lot of the a lot of the factions involved, the fact that you have the the fact that you have the good old Slav squat. <laughs> yeah. Um all of all of that is is and especially especially the especially the monsters and the supernatural folk are very very Polish. I feel like a lot of things would when it comes to cuz I've seen I've seen his videos on that and I I think it's half contrarian and then the other half is just kind of like uh dismissing it mainly because he he holds El- Elric in a higher regard. Yeah, I've, I haven't, I haven't spoken with, I haven't spoken with Razor Fist specifically, but he's, but um, that can, that can, contra- that contrarian stuff, and the fact that he kind of, he kind of undermines his, his, his own points, um, is the reason I don't see eye to eye with him. That's and that's understandable. Yeah. I, I think just in the whole time of uh, being a YouTube content creator, I, I there's a lot of people that I, I like watching their content, but I would probably disagree with uh, at least a, a, a handful of points that most of the, the bigger creators are, are trying to use. 
in his, in his in his particular case, I'm more referring to the to um his his particular boner for for French comics. Oh, Ben doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. I, I saw that video and I was like, well, to each their own. <laughs> I'm not. I'm. Don't get me wrong. I, there's plenty of French comics. There's plenty of French comics that I like. Oh, Ben Desenes are beautiful. It's just uh, the problem he, that I the problem that I had was you're trying you're trying to sell me on it by yeah. by by using by by throwing manga under the bus. Yeah, yeah. It's like it, you you're making fun of weebs for being weebs, but you're being a weeb for the French. So <laughs> it's like two are two wrongs really making a right here. <laughs> well, for for me the, for me the thing is you should be you instead of telling me how much better it is than something else, you should be selling me on its merits. Yeah, and I've I've seen a lot of good Bond Desine, so I'm I don't have to be sold on it on how great Bond Desine can be. It's like. Uh, the early days when people were just discovering anime and they were heavily evangelizing it to other people that really didn't give two shits about it. It's like, let, let them figure it out on their own. You can, if they come to you and ask you like, Hey, I'm just, I just watched this thing and I want to see more like it. I think the only, like. I think the only time I ever went full evangelist was, was when it was when um, people would do the animation is for kids argument. Oh, oh, that old canard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I I don't know why, but there's something that's just uh, there's a primal hatred for that statement. Get to the back of the line. Everybody here in the temple hates that <laughs> statement. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, uh, because it, because it's. Con- I'm not sure. I'm not sure your issue, but mine has always been it's cond- it's condescending to uh, to adults and to children. Well, yeah, a lot of it for me, it was like, what was it? It's, I grew up in just this whole notion that animation is for children. But then, like, when you hear people that are around your age saying, oh, you're just, you're, I'm more mature than you because uh, I, I don't watch animation or whatever. I'm like, uh, being an adult means I get to do whatever the fuck I want, one, and two, there's a lot more complexities in animation and animated films, especially back in the eighties and nineties and a lot of the more modern stuff over and overseas, not here. Uh, but, and, and you actually have to sit down and watch it. Like say, okay, so going back to Ralph Bakshi, mm-hmm. like there's a lot of complexity in wizards and like things like that. But you'd actually have to watch Wizards to get that complexity. Yeah, and there's also the for for me the the uh, the other the other issue that I have with the with the for with um the maturity part is oddly enough I'm reminded of something that C.S. Lewis said, and I usually don't cite C.S. Lewis all that much. I mm-hmm. find I find him to be massively overrated. I think I know the quote, but go go on. <laughs> um, when I became a man, I threw away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be grown up. Yeah, I I one hundred percent feel that statement. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm very comfortable in my being an adult to still enjoy childish things. I think that's my stance on it. I I as I think the thing is i looked at what being an adult entails when i was a kid and i don't want to be that type of person that just comes home and squats in front of the tv and watches the news until it's time to go to bed i get in my day job i have i have to deal with i have to deal with news channels enough as it is Mm. because 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 of my day job i have there's like five different news channels that are on in the background oh my goodness which is which is why I've had the mindset of do not bring that shit do not bring that shit up when I'm off the clock. Yeah, I I definitely understand that. I you know, uh just this last couple of years I've basically got off the politics train and just kind of went back to trying to understand why I wanted to do this in the first place. And that was my love of video games. So I'm trying to wean off with uh, a lot of the that major stuff but my god i there's so many stupid takes concerning video games these days that i, I have I, 
for for me, first off, the um, the the pol getting on the politics train ends ends up being a poison pill more often than not. Mm -hmm. The but the other the other thing is what is I had seen so many people go on go on the, go on the politics thing, especially after twenty sixteen, and become ex become extremely toxic individuals. Yeah. I have and, lost a lot of friends <laughs> in that time period. And in that in that toxicity, they en they end up creating creating the ex creating the exact problems that they're trying to fight against. Mhm. Mm or in or in some cases just just run out their entire audience. And I'd, I obviously didn't want to go down that route, especially yeah, since I... the th the sole re the sole reason I, the sole ethos that I've had with my channel is hi is highlight what's out there, mm -hmm. which is also the reason I get pissed off when people say that there's no good games that say E3 or Gamescom or what have you. There, you just have to look. Like it's, I think uh, people kind of are under the idea that everything has to be good or either all of it's good or none of it's good. It's like, no, you really have to be very, I guess, observant kind of needle in a haystack observant. Except with, with the amount of, with the amount of tech that's at our, that's at people's disposal these days, there's no excuse not to be. Yeah. I've, I'm very big into indie games because that's where I'm seeing a lot of the creativity that I, I miss from the eighties uh, and nineties. Like I, I guess if I were only to play just triple A games, I would kind of be of that mindset of there's nothing good anymore. But if I, I see an indie game that's really awesome, and I'm like, well, I should probably let more people know that this thing exists, or whatever. Then, then it's beneficial for both of us because, like, just the just the oh, what was it, the Right and Fight game that. Uh, mm -hmm came out and it surprised me that they contacted me after I did my video and did like a uh, kind of a, a let's play of the the demo and uh, they contacted me and told me that hey I uh, we enjoyed your content on this and your feedback about the stuff because I was like I just told them hey I would love to, for controller support in this game and they liked it so much they actually put my picture and a couple other people's pictures in the game mm -hmm. in the backgrounds. So I was like I wasn't expecting that, but I thought that was kind of cool. It's like now I'm immortalized in a video game. That's yep. something I would have never dreamt of back in 2008. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that you had you had your whole, you had the whole thing go down with with YouTube, but from what, from as I understand it, you're st you're still doing stuff on on Odyssey and Rumble and um, Twitch. Yes, I uh, I'm gonna be uh, my show with Bloody Jen called Real Negro Hours. <laughs> we're we're gonna be uh, probably taking the show onto Twitch for the foreseeable future, at least until I can uh, get my website up, and then I'll probably be trying to uh, run streams and I'll put my Odyssey and Rumble videos. Uh, on the website too. Just, I just want a central hub to where everything is available through the website. So, mm -hmm. and the instance of I, w I will never have another YouTube situation where they could just take away things from you and y they're gone. Mm -hmm. And I'll so I'll certainly look I'll certainly look forward to that to that sort of thing. And depending on depending on the t depending on the time of the time of day, I might even I might even try and crash the party. I, I would be totally okay with that. I kind of, I need to do more streams with other people too, because I I kind I tend to forget at times that I don't have to necessarily like do everything by myself. <laughs> I'm such a workaholic though that uh, as I'm getting older, I'm realizing like, yeah, I, I kind of have to put the brakes on some things, or else I'm gonna die of a heart attack at some point. I hope that's not foreshadowing. <laughs> Best not to tempt the gods of fate. Yeah, let me knock on wood on that one. Mm -hmm. But with but with all with all of that said, I do want to 
I do want to I do want to to um to give you my thanks for the fact that you were that you were oh, you were um willing to <laughs> willing to um come on come all the way to my temple and I would say brave the hell of time zones but you and I are in the same time zone. I was going to say you could say finally it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I'm totally I'm terrible with social media, and I, think I hope of my... I hope I don't have to badger you for for nine mo- for nine more months for uh, when it comes to a return. I know if I if I were better at social media, I would have like I've been on here sooner. Mm-hmm. Well, does that does that even include email? Because I know I emailed you at least once. I like I said, I don't. I don't check email often, and I was off Twitter for two years because the twenty six or the twenty twenty election just soured me on Twitter entirely. So I uh, I took a two year diet off of Twitter, and now that I'm in the situation that I'm in, I'm like, well, maybe I should start checking my uh, like all my emails and stuff, and actually getting into contact because I I got messages from other people to do their shows as well, and I felt like a complete ass for not like looking at the sooner Mm -hmm. so i I do apologize on that well anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged Mm, i I am uh i'm good at that (laughs) (laughs) and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!